Some of the best poems to come out of World War I came from Siegfried Sassoon, the British writer. Not just the era, but the trenches themselves. He was a soldier fighting on the Western Front for some of the ugliest parts of the war. He, uh, he led a very interesting life, and he had a, uh, a great gift that he came to a little late. He was kind of a playboy in his earlier, uh, uh, earlier youth, but he started to take more uh, seriously his artistic vocation when he met fellow, uh, uh, fellow poet Wilfred Owen and started to really uh, develop his skill a little bit more acutely. And a, what arises from that is a, uh, a great variety of uh, essentially anti-war poetry from a soldier, uh, a, a, a new voice questioning the uh, legitimacy of the war, the logic of the war, the image of the war, uh, and uh, this great uh, burgeoning voice of modernism coming in uh questioning the uh, the existential uh value of any of it um you can see this again and again and again in his work he doesn't write long poems he, he stayed relatively uh uh, uh concise uh that, that's uh, part of his modernism quite frankly but they uh they, they often pack quite a punch and and show some real Bite. But also, they bridge uh, very much a kind of uh, Victorian youth, Victorian growth period that he's coming out of, and this critical turning point into modernism, where certain tendencies just seem to be on the, uh, just seem to be evolving in real time on the page. Um, from 1916, they. The bishop tells us, when the boys come back, they will not be the same, for they'll have fought in a just cause. They'll lead the last attack on Antichrist. Their comrades' blood has bought new right to breed an honorable race. They have challenged death and dared him face to face. We're none of us the same, the boys reply. For George lost both his legs and Bill's stone blind. Poor Jim's shot through the lungs and like to die, and Bert's gone syphilitic. You'll not find a chap who served that hasn't found some change. And the bishop said, the ways of God are strange. The rhyme is not forced throughout. It is remarkably uh, casual. It is remarkably... Um, uh, spoken. Uh, it is not particularly ostentatious, uh, but it is there. There is a structure to this poem, even if it does not always feel like it, but you can see back, f back attack, uh, race face, bought, uh, bought, uh, fought, fought, but you, you can see these, uh, the rhyme scheme playing out, but it doesn't really read that way. It's, uh, the, uh, the, the form is somewhat suffused. So it sounds really quite casual until you get to those, uh, those last, uh, couplets at the end or those last lines at the end where, um, uh, race and face to face, um, just sounds so trite, just sounds so, uh, you know, a little too tidy, which of course is what all of the, um, uh, which is of course is the ironic perspective on what the, uh, the bishop is saying, that everything he's saying is just, you know, uh, silly, silly, um, ridiculous stuff, and it has no ring of truth to it, uh, and the rhyme just sort of twists it that way. But then in the uh, in in that last couplet on the uh, for the second stanza, you know, the chap who served who hasn't found some change is what the boys say, uh, offering the truth of the horror that they have come through and the the bedraggled mess they have uh, they find themselves. Um, and the bishop said, "The ways of God are strange." So again, the rhyme comes in as a kind of uh, ironic commentary. The rhyme is being used against the poem itself, in a way. Uh, the, uh, the oddity of it seems so old-fashioned, seems so superficial, seems so untrue, 
that he's turning the form uh, he's highlighting the form as a commentary on the content or he's using the content the, uh, to as a commentary on the form probably more accurately but you can see all those little mechanisms happening throughout the poem that's really 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 rich um, the rear guard from April 17 the Hindenburg line Groping along the tunnel, step by step, he winked his prying torch with patching glare. From side to side, he sniffed the unwholesome air. Tins, boxes, bottles, shapes too vague to know. A mirror smashed a mattr the mattress from a bed, and he, exploring fifty feet below, the rosy gloom of battle overhead. You can see the detritus, you can see the wreckage, you can see a uh, ground eye view of a, uh, of a soldier uh, or a, a human being experiencing uh, the horror of something happening up ahead, uh, overhead. Uh, tripping, he grabbed the wall. Someone saw someone lie humped at his feet, half hidden by a rug, and he stooped to give the sleeper's arm a tug. I'm looking for headquarters, no reply. God blast your neck. For days he'd had no sleep. Get up and guide me through this stinking place. Savaged, he kicked a soft, unanswering heap and flashed his beam across the livid face, terribly glaring up, whose eyes yet, yet wore agony dying hard ten days before, and fists of fingers clutched a blackening wound. Uh, the horror of recognition of what he has done, the horror of recognition of what has become of uh, this uh, lump in, uh, on the floor in front of him. Uh, the blackening wound is, uh, you know, the putrefaction, the gangrene, whatever you want to call it. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's hideous. Alone, he staggered on until he found Dawn's ghost that filtered down a shafted stair to the dazed, muttering creatures underground who hear the boom of shells in muffled sound. At last, with sweat of horror in his hair, he climbed through darkness to the twilight air, unloading hell behind him step by step. That step-by-step step comes as a, another uh, unrhymed commentary on what has come before and points out that things are different now. The, uh, the recognition of this person who has been groping through the darkness, through the debris, and stumbles across this body uh, is now changed. And it is, the, the rhyme comes less regularly, and it seems almost quite tentative step-by-step. Step. Like We're not taking anything for granted anymore. We're not... Uh, we're not advancing with any confidence. We are now just trying to go focus on putting one foot in front of the other because the recognition has really set in. Uh, the general uh, gives a little bit of irony in the, the classic uh, uh, grunts view of the brass in, in any army from time immemorial. Uh, good morning, good morning, the general said when we met him last week on our way to the line. Now the soldiers he smiled at are most of them dead, and we're cursing his staff for incompetent swine. He's a cheery old card, grunted Harry to Jack as they slogged up to Arras with rifle and pack. But he did for them, but he did for them both by his plan of attack. Which is another interesting way of form because it has that little bit of space that that skipped line down to that last line. Um, it it the rhyme is very regular, the meter is very regular. It sort of dances along, uh, but it is a uh, the the classic perspective of the general who you know gives orders and sends people off, and then they all get slaughtered and. Uh, he, uh, the, the speaker here, the narrator, is just commenting on it. It doesn't really seem to bother the general much. He was very cheery that day when he was sending us all off to die. Um, and, and that remove of what he did for them both by his plan of attack suggests, again, like a, a kind of literal physical separation from the men, the general from the men, the general from perhaps the reality of what uh, what they're all facing out there every day. 
uh, glory of women, another perspective on the uh, uh, on the uh, the role of uh, uh, of a a player in this that is perhaps uh, un unrecognized or unheralded. Um, you love us when we're heroes, home on leave, or wounded in a mentionable place. You worship decorations. You believe that chivalry d redeems the war's disgrace. You make us shells. You listen with delight by tales of dirt and danger fondly thrilled. You crown our distant ardors where we fight and mourn our laureled memories when we're killed. You can't believe that British troops retire when hell's last horror breaks them and they run, trampled with terrible corpses, blind with blood. O oh, German mother, dreaming by the fire, while you were, are knitting socks to send your son, his face is trodden deeper in the mud. Look how, again, this is a fairly standard sonnet, a Trarkin sonnet. You see the, uh, the octet sets off this polite little view of how women sort of see kind of blithely what uh, a soldier uh, is and you know they're kind of entertained by it and they like their role of uh, of cheering up the troops and stuff like that you know, they give them little gifts they send little decorations they uh, they ooh and ah over the uniforms and all that stuff but then in the uh, the second part the sestet um you can't believe that when you uh that british troops retire when hell's last horror breaks them and they run you can't accept that there is genuine horror genuine panic and fear that is a regular part of a soldier's daily life um the the it's a little too real perhaps but notice also that is that this the sestet gets kicked off by uh, the word killed. Killed ends the octet before that is at the end of that line. So that reality is suddenly, uh, okay, that's going to change the tone. It's another little turning point. It's another little inflection that, oh, things are different now. Um, and, and that image of the, the German woman, he's, uh, he's applying this to both sides here. Uh, the German mother. Uh, who is sending uh, uh, sending socks to her son? Doesn't realize that you know he, he's dead and his face is down in the mud. Um, it's it's a really awful uh, contrast between the, uh, the vision of the mother and the uh, uh, well the reality of the uh, of the soldier. Um, on passing the new men in gate. Who will remember, passing through this gate, the unheroic dead who fed the guns? Who shall absolve the foulness of their fate, those doomed, conscripted, unvictorious ones? Crudely renewed, the salient holds its own. Paid are its dim defenders by this pomp. Paid with a, with a pile of peace-complacent stone. The armies who endured that sullen swamp. Here was the world's worst wound. And here with pride, their names liveth forever, the gateway claims. Was ever an immolation so belied as these intolerable nameless names? Well might the dead who struggled in the slime rise and deride this sepulcher of crime. Uh, interesting take here, if you, if you look at it. Uh, very gripping, obviously, and in, in, in it's uh, in, again the division between the uh, the actuality of the experience with its portrait in uh, in, in polite society, perhaps. Uh, but also notice that the the uh, the gate, the sepulchre, these uh, these um, uh, monuments to the war dead uh, uh, is a real place, and all that stuff reality history yada yada but the monuments are seen as a bit of an insult to the reality because they uh they're telling a lie you know their name liveth forever but you don't even know their names their uh, uh the devastation is too great to uh encapsulate 
on a, uh, on a on an inscription and that gives a bit of a view of the inadequacy of art itself the uh, Siegfried Sassoon is here calling into question the <clears throat> um, the, the the possibility of any art capturing what is true and for a uh, for an artist that's a that's a troubling perspective it's a very modernist perspective it's a very um ironic perspective where you're starting to realize the limitations of what art can do the limitations of what language can do the limitations of perception itself and the idea that if perception is limited then we are all uh we're all walking around with our own set of perceptions and there is no objective perception and there is no objective truth no objective truth means that there's no organization in the universe there is no such thing as god perhaps there's all of these layers of horror and so the poem again becomes a kind of turning point where uh where this recognition this dawning uh catharsis happens right there in the middle of the poem and everything afterwards is different it's a uh a, it's it's dramatic one of the more uh interesting poems he writes about the uh the after effects of the war um uh, it comes from a uh, uh one called uh, the repression of war experience which is a uh, a remarkable early document of uh ptsd and also of uh, the uh, polyphony of the modernist age in poetry. <clears throat> now light the candles. One, two, there's a moth. What silly beggars they are to blunder in and scorch their wings with glory, liquid flame. No, no, not that. It's bad to think of war. When thoughts you've gagged all day come back to scare you. And it's been proved that soldiers don't go mad unless they lose control of ugly thoughts that drive them out to jabber among the trees. Now light your pipe. Look, what a steady hand. Draw a deep breath. Stop thinking. Count 15. And you're right as rain. Why won't it rain? I wish there'd be a thunderstorm tonight with bucketfuls of water to sluice the dark and make the roses hang their dripping heads books what a jolly company they are standing so quiet and patient on their set on their shelves dressed in dim brown and black and white and green every kind of color which will you read come on oh do read something they're so wise i tell you all the wisdom of the world is waiting for you on those shelves and yet you sit and gnaw your nails and let your pipe out and listen to the silence on the ceiling, there's one big, dizzy moth that bumps and flutters. And in the breathless air outside the house, the garden awaits for something that delays. There must be crowds of ghosts among the trees, not people killed in battle. They're in France. But horrible shapes and shrouds, old men who died slow, natural deaths. Old men with ugly souls who wore their bodies out with nasty sins. You're quiet and peaceful simmering safe at home you'd never think there was a war a bloody war on oh yes you would why you can hear the guns hark thud 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 quiet soft they never cease those whispering guns oh christ i want to go out and screech at them to stop i'm going crazy i'm going stark staring mad because of the guns this is one person's thoughts this is one person presumably a, uh, a former soldier a veteran of the war uh, back home and trying to adjust to a very different reality trying to come to grips as his thoughts cannot really focus and nothing can bring him comfort you get you can get the sense of a very literate man who's looking at his books his bookshelves and he, he finds them somehow offensive and cold and he cannot enjoy what he used to enjoy and now everything is different and it harkens back to that step by step 
one foot after the other. This is a mind that is very much uh, crippled and it's trying to find a coherent way forward. You get a stream of consciousness, only it's a troubled stream. The, uh, the thoughts become quite erratic. The thoughts jump from one thing to the other. Uh, right as rain is something he seizes on. It's a, it's a cliche. It's a common little saying. It's, oh, I'm right as rain. But then that just tricks off another thought of, well, you know, why won't it rain? And, and the rain will wash something away. That's that, that yearning to be clean, to be cleansed of his memories, perhaps of his sins. It's one of the darkest poems to come out of World War I. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's remarkable in its, uh, its vision. It's remarkably prescient in its uh, uh, grasp of uh, psychological wounds for, uh, for returning soldiers. But it's also a fascinating document of modernism coming into be right in front of you. Uh, he was, you know, he, he was just trying to write little ditties. And for the most part, he's working within fairly structured rhyme forms that are evolving out of it because he's finding difficulty um, maintaining these forms, maintaining these neat organized structures uh, while his content is just so jagged and uneven and breaking out all over it because it can't be contained. That's, that's the modernist age coming into being right there, being born on the page in real time. And he, he had a long career following this. Siegfried Sassoon, um, he wrote a little bit less, but uh, but he lived, I think, into uh, like the late 1960s um, uh, or around there. And uh, you know, he, he he had some he had some success along the way, but uh, his legacy is almost entirely tied into that war and uh, the experiences that come out of it captured a moment like few others really could and I think laid the groundwork as a bridge from uh, from a kind of uh, Victorian Edwardian sensibility into the modernist age.